But with all due respect, the United Nations is a relic from a different time when nations were unique in their ability to solve the world's problems. But that just isn't the case anymore, primarily because you have outsourced the job to me. I have sent people to die in your wars. So I feel uniquely qualified to tell you, your wars don't work. Which is why my priorities have changed from profits to policy, because politicians don't know how to solve problems, but I do. So let's be clear. I am here to solve the world's problems. And I believe the world's problems begin with you. Every time, every goddamn time, it happened again. For those of you new to the channel, it's a running gag that every time I write a report or do an article on the war, something happens in Ukraine which forces me to change my schedule. This month, I was writing a script on the air war. We have Vipers confirmed, debates about Hornets, pilots being trained on Gripen, Kinzel vs. Patriot, the future of Russia's air campaign, and how the Ukrainians will go about turning the tide of the air war in their favor, all this sort of stuff. And sure enough, just when I think I finally have a video or a script ready to go, wham! Only this time it wasn't the Ukrainians who've done it to me. No, of all people, it was Wagner. Really? Well, even though I'm a bit late to the party, I, I still have to talk about this, because this is A, colossally important, B, outrageously funny, and C, incredibly infuriating. Seriously. Prigozhin. After all that hype, you back out at the last minute? Come on. That's a b move even for you. Anyway, let's break down this absolute clown show from the very beginning. What happened, how it happened, and what are the future implications? And to do that... Like always on a History Channel, we have to go back to the beginning. So, for the first time as far as I'm aware, we have the full story of Putin versus Wagner. And to do that, we have to first make sure we've got our sources right. And today, we actually have some help with that. Today we are sponsored by a service I actually used in my day-to-day -day before they offered to sponsor this video. These days, trust in media is at rock bottom, polarization is at its worst, politicization and corporatization of the news has commodified and trivialized the flow of crucial information, but thankfully for us, there is an answer to the problem. Ground News. They are one of, if not the, best source of news on the internet, and best of all, they cover that news from every angle. You can compare headlines on literally any subject, filter the presented articles by factuality, location, and political bias, all while following specific topics, which for me is very useful in following the war in Ukraine. This article, for example, is covering the very real threat of a nuclear disaster at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which could cause an international incident of a proportion that will blow the coup right out of the water. And the level of reporting matches that threat. You can see here that just about everyone is talking about it. And Ground News makes sure to include everyone. See, even Infowars is here. They're reporting that this is actually a Gulf of Tonkin incident and that America is going to blow up the plant in a false flag done by the CIA. Really interesting stuff. And as you can see on the interface, it shows you the publication, which way it leans, and what country it originates from, which is a big help when you're trying to filter out the propaganda. Just read the difference in the headlines and see for yourself. Us YouTubers can't be up to date 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, even though we try, and the only reason I manage is thanks to Ground News, so this product is a must to keep up with things going on. But my absolute favourite feature of this whole app is Blindspot. In here you can find news stories that are being underreported, which in the polarised political landscape of today is a useful tool to see what different media outlets want you to know, and what they don't want you to know. Plus, it can also be a source of fantastic entertainment, seeing some of the more extreme publications and what they are saying. Seriously, it's hilarious, easy to use, and the most enjoyable way to read the news, helping you become a more informed and well-rounded individual, able to understand both sides by cutting through the polarization and bias so prevalent in the modern world. So, click the link in the description to get a special promotional offer at ground news forward slash animarchy and try out this absolutely amazing product. I use it, my podcast colleagues on the Even Rounder table use it, and I highly, highly recommend it. Many thanks to them for sponsoring us today, but now it's time to get back to the video.
When it comes to the main characters of the Russo-Ukrainian war, aside from the national leaders like Putin or Zelensky, Yevgeny Prigozhin is by far the standout in terms of public profile. A criminal from a young age, from his late teens until his mid-twenties, he spent close to a decade in prison for various larceny offences and semi-organised crime. He was the founder of a number of youth gangs, responsible for burglary, armed robbery and fraud, with many of these crimes being personally carried out by him while leading his teenage accomplices. Luckily for him, however, this was the 1980s and the regime that imprisoned him was spiralling down to its destruction. During the impending collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990, Prigozhin was released back into the world just in time for both the arrival of capitalism and the foundation of what we know today as the Russian Mafia. He started out small as a hot dog salesman in the open air markets of St. Petersburg, but being a former convict gang leader who was now in the food industry, he knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy, if you know what I mean. Hospitality establishments have always been the legal fronts for organized crime ever since the Collegia in Rome. And so, with the aid of his friends, Prigozhin got into the most profitable underground business sector there is, the casino business. But to do that, of course, he had to work with, aka bribe, the local government in St. Petersburg, which of course oversaw the operations and regulations of gambling establishments inside the city. This meant he had to have close relations with the mayor, or in this case, the mayor's deputy, who was the chairman of the committee overseeing the gambling sector in the St. Petersburg economy. That man's name was, of course, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. And so, both a business relationship and two meteoric careers were born. Prigozhin's enterprises were wildly successful, allowing him to diversify into just about every affiliated business sector, like supermarket chains and other parts of the hospitality sector, like bars or clubs, raising him in the ranks of Russia's oligarchs in terms of wealth. But it was his move into luxury catering which allowed him to enter Russia's most exclusive circles. Because while money is power, in the world of politics and prestige, what matters is knowing the people who matter. And as luck would have it, Yevgeny Prigozhin knew the one man in Russia who mattered more than anyone else. After launching his company, the Concord Group, to merge his various enterprises, he founded the subsidiary Concord Catering by establishing several high-class restaurants serving Russia's most exclusive clientele. To contractors and suppliers, most of whom were run either in-house or by Prigozhin's fellow oligarchs, giving him the ability to provide catering for large events, such as large diplomatic functions laid on by the Kremlin. Now we're seeing it come together. He would end up being known as Putin's chef, managing everything from government parties to serving George W. Bush, and as you can imagine, the paycheck for such a position was absolutely gratuitous. Prigozhin had become one of the richest men in Russia. Private jets, yachts, a compound in St. Petersburg with every amenity. Things were looking great. However, running a consulting firm catering company and large-scale gambling ring wasn't enough, especially when your business survives on government contracts. Prigozhin wanted to expand, and in the post-9-11 world of mass media, globalization, and corporate imperialism, a world where government and big business are locked in constant war with consumers and public opinion across cyberspace, there is one business, one very special business, which makes more money on government contracts than anything else combined. Private security. In modern media, the private military company, or the PMC, has had a much higher profile in recent years, and for very good reason. They have appeared both as heroes and villains in movies, TV series, and especially games. I opened this video with a meme edit of Call of Duty for a reason. Not to mention, associating Prigozhin with Kevin Spacey is a delicious jab I couldn't resist. Though I have to admit, both of them are very good actors. Mercenaries are not a new thing. It's the second oldest profession in history for a reason besides the, uh, well that one. Back then it was a case of better those men dying than my own men to preserve my own power. However today it's much safer economically and politically for governments to use hired help for smaller jobs that don't really need a military deployment, or more often the case, the morally questionable jobs you don't want your name on the paperwork for as the situation necessitates. Sending the army to guard an oil rig from a local militia in a third world country you aren't supposed to be in will look very bad in the press, especially if there are casualties. But, 
if you hire a PMC, you can get up on stage and say, We have no troops in Country X, nor are we planning to send any. Better yet, the oil company can hire the PMC directly and cut out the government entirely, privately funding the whole operation with not a single taxpayer dollar spent while keeping it out of the media entirely. Not our money, no confirmed casualties, not our problem. The United States has been doing this for decades now, even before 9-11, as have American corporations. Coca-Cola, for example, hired private military companies to act as Pinkerton-esque death squads on their sugar plantations in South America, busting unions and killing strike leaders, etc., etc. While companies operating in unstable parts of the world hire mercenaries on a regular basis, shipping companies passing through the Straits of Hormuz and areas near Somalia and the Suez Canal, all of them have armed personnel on board to deter piracy. Oil companies have armed security at their facilities, with a big focus on protecting pipelines from sabotage, while the US government uses PMCs for VIP security and as undercover low-profile firepower for CIA field officers in countries where there isn't a substantial military presence, or they're not supposed to be. The most famous example of these being the field office in Benghazi, for uh, obvious reasons. So, picture this. You are in a world where plausible deniability, corporate imperialism, and covert operations in the third world are the way forward in the new Cold War. Russia's military is horridly corrupt, while its lower ranks are chronically underpaid. Its very few professional soldiers, some of whom being tier 1 operators, are treated like absolute trash, relying on patriotism and status for retention, which, if the global war on terror veterans are anything to go by, are not fantastic motivators. Prigozhin saw an opportunity here. Russia was in the market for a Blackwater, and if there was one thing he knows how to do, it's exploit a gap in the market. Enter Wagner Group. Kremlin Security Solutions. Dial a death squad. A new NKVD for a new Russia. Call them what you like. Russia had itself a private army, and it would see a success in the private military complex sphere not seen since the days of the Lanchnecks or even Carthage. The story starts with Dmitry Utkin, a former member of Spetsnaz GRU and a veteran of both Chechen wars. He is also an overt Russian hypernationalist and neo-Nazi with the callsign Wagner, which is where the company gets its name. After demobilizing from the Russian army in 2013, Utkin got a job working for a PMC guarding oil pipelines in Syria, eventually forming a group called the Slavonic Corps of said PMC, made out of his former army buddies and other veterans from across Eastern Europe. However, their first deployment was a disaster. The Syrian government didn't provide them with the assets they needed, while the battle itself went even worse. When they reached their objective area, it turned out the force they were sent to fight outnumbered them 10 to 1. They were outmaneuvered and eventually forced to retreat with heavy losses. Given the circumstances, the survivors, along with their wounded, traveled home to Russia, only to be detained by the FSB for engaging in illegal mercenary activity. Luckily for them, though, there was an extremely well-connected man looking to get into the PMC business who needed just these kinds of men. And so, aside from a couple of fall guys who got quietly pardoned later, the Slavonic Corps was off the hook and freshly set up with an official Russian MOD contract to provide security assistance to the Russian Federation and its global partners. After all, they had some uh, operational hurdles coming up and they needed trained personnel. However, given all the bad press, a new name and a new base of operations was required. Enter the Wagner Group of St. Petersburg. As Euromaidan spread chaos throughout Ukraine, Crimea was a hotbed of pro-Russian sentiment. While most of the region was in favour of the new pro-European government in Kyiv, Sevastopol and Kerch both hosted large Russian military bases, forming a cornerstone of the local socio-economic structure. They are also prominent places in Russian history, as the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet, and the site of some of the most important battles ever fought in Eastern Europe across several major wars, especially World War II. Not to mention a majority Russian population after Stalin ever so slightly carried out a settler colonialist genocide against the Ukrainian Cossacks and Crimean Tatars who lived in the region for centuries, until they were deported and replaced with Russian settlers throughout his reign of terror. With a divided population and several bases of critical military importance to the Russian navy, the Kremlin decided to annex the region to protect their interests, and at the vanguard of this operation were the Little Green Men. 
undercover infiltrators and airborne inserted special forces to secure critical infrastructure, government buildings, and to contain the Ukrainian garrison. In this vanguard was none other than Dmitry Utkin and the Wagner Group. As we know, the operation to secure the peninsula went quickly and efficiently, with the local government resigning and the Ukrainian army, such as it was, withdrawing without a fight. After a rigged referendum and a mass exodus of pro-Maidan Ukrainians, Crimea was firmly under Russian control. However, the fight was well and truly on in eastern Ukraine as what became the LNR and DPR began to form. And it was here that Prigozhin began seeing dollar signs. Unlike Crimea, the conflict in the Donbass couldn't be seen as a direct intervention by Moscow due to no, quote, legitimate reasons for intervening. Of course, no one was actually fooled into thinking the separatists weren't backed by Moscow. But as we've established, in the modern world of information warfare, diluting the narrative with plausible deniability is a must, while also being straight out of the Kremlin propaganda playbook. Yes, you know we're lying, but if we lie enough, eventually it becomes the truth. You know, I can't remember who actually said that originally, but I think Utkin was a fan of him. Anyway, with a separatist civil war now ravaging the eastern half of the country with no end in sight, Russia needed a permanent presence of professional soldiers to augment the militias in order to ensure the survival of the breakaway states and, of course, to enforce Kremlin policy, as well as giving a means to funnel high-tech hardware to the front line. The details of their activities in the Donbass war are hazy, which is to be expected. However, we do know that they participated in all major combat operations, were responsible for keeping order among the disparate militias in the separatist movements, and they were equipped with heavier duty gear than the militia units, specifically in terms of anti-air equipment. They are confirmed to be the culprits in the shootdown of an IL-76 with a full load of Ukrainian paratroopers on board and there are very credible rumours that they were the same unit responsible for the shootdown of Malaysian Airlines Flight MH17. In any case, that isn't what's important. What is important is that Wagner contractors were constantly getting combat experience, while the company itself had a constant guaranteed revenue stream, allowing them to expand their manpower pool and their influence to every area Russian interests, whether they be state or business, were present, which is mainly in Syria and Africa. Since their formation, Wagner has been hired by various less-than-savory characters around the world. They've served as bodyguards for Maduro in Venezuela, they've acted as quasi-special forces for the Russian contingent in Syria, while also working closely with the Assad regime. But it's the African warlords who have formed the backbone of their customer base. Using Wagner contractors to intimidate political rivals, protect VIPs, including the leaders themselves, provide security for key resources or businesses such as mines or oil pipelines, which Wagner themselves got a direct cut from. And finally, but most importantly, they are hired to crush any and all forms of dissent, whether it be internal or external. Which, given that Wagner is a Russian mercenary company not covered by the Geneva Convention, operating far away from prying eyes has resulted in some of the worst atrocities committed in modern history. With one massacre in the Central African Republic involving torture, beheadings, mass executions, and, quote, disemboweling pregnant women, with the reported justification being to send a message. By the turn of the new decade, Wagner numbered between five to 10,000 members, most of them veterans or hardened criminals with a history of violence. They had a strong revenue stream and contacts across the world, the highest, of course, being Putin himself. Things were looking good, and then things were looking great. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, Wagner formed a vital part of the initial plan. Split into two operational groups, the Plainclothes Division had been infiltrating Ukraine throughout January and establishing a base of operations in Kyiv to conduct assassinations, as well as fifth column operations, with one of their primary targets being, of course, Zelensky himself. The second group was the force integrated with the Russian army itself forming small cadres throughout the invasion force to carry out specialist tasks and forward reconnaissance for the main echelon. However, like the invasion itself, their missions met with far stronger resistance than expected. Their infiltrators in Kyiv were rounded up within the first 36 hours, while their assassination targets were safely locked down in secure locations across the city. 
Wagner forces would continue fighting alongside Russian troops across Ukraine in pursuit of their objectives, achieving marginal success in the Donbass and Kherson. However, the advance on the capital, as we know, was a complete disaster, forcing the entire invading force to withdraw, leaving atrocity after atrocity in their wake. The most infamous, of course, being the massacre at Bucha, which evidence suggests was organized and carried out by Wagner officers and men. As Moscow evaluated its options and redeployed its forces, Prigozhin ordered that Wagner be expanded to meet the growing needs of the Russian MOD in carrying out the, quote, special military operation. And that right there was the problem. Given that as far as the Kremlin was concerned, this isn't a war, they couldn't initiate full mobilization, nor could they overextend the contracts beyond their current enlistment period, meaning, consequentially, they had to recoup their losses by signing on new MOD contract soldiers, plugging the gaps with their yearly draft intake, though technically they weren't supposed to be posted to the front lines, and as we know, they ignored that, but anyway. And of course, they made up the difference by employing private military contractors to handle specialist roles and training, while providing an elite infantry formation. The soldiers from the VDV and Spetsnaz, whose contracts ran out in 2022, proved to be a valuable recruiting ground for Wagner PMC, as why would they re-enlist with the MOD for a thousand bucks a month when they could make two and a half to three thousand bucks working for Wagner? Makes sense, right? But Prigozhin was thinking bigger. Given the fact that this war was going to be bloody and long term, he had an opportunity not just to expand his business, but to do so exponentially. And as we know, capitalism is all about growth. And so Wagner PMC went all in on recruitment for the Ukrainian front, bringing back a number of their best units from Africa and the Middle East, while offering lucrative contracts not just for former operators, but for anyone with prior professional military experience, from any neutral or friendly nation. PMCs in Russia are technically illegal, and as such they mostly operated as private security firms or contracting agencies with a small number of highly trained personnel. No more. Wagner wasn't just going big, it was going bloody global. And they were going to do much more than just provide muscle for corporations or guarding VIPs. With their contacts in the Russian military and a direct line to the Kremlin, Wagner Group was going to be rebranded as Eastern Europe's Army for Hire, complete with an air force, tanks and artillery. By April of 2022, the Wagner Group was starting to deploy entire field formations in the Donbass area of operations, taking a leading role in several major engagements, including the battles of Popazna, Lizichansk, as well as the now infamous Battle of Sveridonetsk, where the Russians repeatedly assaulted the same river crossing and got massacred in the process. Though funnily enough, Wagner decided not to join in on that phase of the operation. I wonder why. The professionals took one look at that and went, nah. I think I'd rather not. But, be that as it may, however, their casualties were still heavy, as attritional frontline combat in a peer-to-peer -peer conflict always is. They were going to need more men. Unlike the army, though, they can't just draft people. It was then a light bulb went off, and Wagner became a household name the world over. Prisons. As an Australian, this is just the regular draft, obviously, but for Prigozhin, it was a revelation. Where else can you get a bunch of desperate ready-made manpower with a propensity for violence and nothing to lose? By July of 2022, Wagner had managed to assemble a professional force, numbering between five to 10,000 men. These troops mostly had combat experience in either Ukraine or from other deployments in Syria. They would form the leadership cadre for his expanded force and his tactical assault elements, as well as specialist units to handle different equipment and battlefield roles. These roles included every aspect of combined arms warfare, as we mentioned before, including a full battalion of tanks, an entire integrated air defense network for their sector of the front, and a squadron of Su-25 Frogfoots provided by the Russian Aerospace Forces, the VKS. The rest of PMC Wagner would be made up of volunteers from the Russian prison system. The deal was simple enough. Sign on with the group, go through basic training, and then off to the front. If you survive your six-month tour, you get a full pardon and 2,000 American dollars in your back pocket for your pay. Absolutely sweet deal. Only as you can imagine, it wasn't. Payment is on completion of the contract. And while Prigozhin claimed their families would receive a payout if they died, the contracts weren't officially recorded and the inmates deployed without their ID. 
meaning the relatives of the KIA inmates couldn't lodge a claim. Precosian had exactly what he needed. Meat shields. Tactically efficient and politically useful meat shields. And he would definitely need them for the Russian Donbass offensive, because despite all conventional military logic, the Ukrainians had decided to dig in and fight for every inch, leading to the now famous Battle of Bakhmut. The fight for a small, strategically insignificant town in eastern Ukraine would normally be just a footnote in the myriad of conflicts that have raged across this region throughout history, but due to its highly defensible geography and Russia's desperate need for a decisive combat success, it served the purposes of both sides, and so the Battle of Bakhmut would end up representing the entire war. And at the spearhead of Russia's effort to take this city was Wagner Group, who, in typical Russian fashion, began purchasing victories with blood. The most frequently used tactic by Wagner forces was a microcosm of deep battle, human wave assaults. Initiate contact with the enemy by advancing a force of penal troops towards Ukrainian positions. This will force them to open fire or be overrun, which in turn reveals their firing and observation points. Once the attack wave has been wiped out or withdrawn, Wagner sends in its elite troops, comprised of former Spetsnaz and VDV soldiers, to assault and clear the position or make use of their heavy support fires to blast it off the map. Given the static nature of the fighting around Bakhmut, these tactics prove very effective. Furthermore, Wagner's closer integration with their support assets, both artillery and airborne, allowed for much more effective fire coordination with frontline troops. Casualties were very high, with some estimates putting Wagner's casualties for the special military operation as high as 30,000, with 9,000 of that being KIA, most of those being in the fighting around Bakhmut. However, a victory, no matter how Pyrrhic, is still a victory, especially when Russian forces were suffering defeat after defeat everywhere else. Even with 90% casualties per assault, Wagner was gaining ground, killing Ukrainian soldiers and, most importantly, filming every minute of it. Their capture of Solidar to the north of Bakhmut, threatening the city with a double envelopment, was widely publicized, and it wasn't Russian flags they were waving, but the flag of their company. Prigozhin made speeches on the front, and unlike Russian media, he was far more candid regarding combat operations and, more dangerously, casualties. He also wasn't shy about calling out failures in the Russian military's chain of command, both in their decision-making and battlefield performance. Wagner's conscripts had been brutally cut down for weeks, and yet Ukrainian troops, as well as other Russian units, confirmed that the experienced professional Wagner fighters were very effective. So much so that they were now the most effective unit on the front lines, more effective than Katarov Chechens or the VDV. And it was here that the problems began. Picture this. You're Shoigu. Your campaign has been a complete and utter disaster. The mission was three days to Kiev, it's now day 200. You've lost Kharkiv, and it looks like you're going to lose Kherson as well. The few victories you have won haven't been anything noteworthy, and in the process your forces performed absolutely terribly. Like, I don't know, just let me pick a random example here, launching an offensive across the same river crossing no less than seven times in a row, losing an entire battalion tactical group in the process. You now have a manpower shortage, but Putin can't mobilize the reservists because technically this isn't a war, so you have to rely on Wagner Group to fill in the gaps in the line, which in turn means they eventually grow to the size of a division, holding down the most vital sector of the front in Bakhmut. And now, after all that, thanks to all the things we've discussed up to this point, the best equipment, priority for recruitment and ammo supplies, but worst of all, all the credit for the few victories that you do have are going to a jumped-up privileged oligarch sucking Putin's dictator, who has his own private military outside of your chain of command. I think you can see how this goes. Shoigu has a lot of friends, or rather his own personal cabal of yes-men like Putin does, and allies of convenience. In a corrupt oligarchic dictatorship, the only way you get ahead, or rather, the only way you get to be the head of the military, is by being a more corrupt, scheming oligarch bastard than anyone else around you. He has survived numerous purges, embezzled millions of state funds for his own purposes, crushed hundreds of political rivals, all to get to his post. And that survival instinct was sounding red alert, and man battle stations louder than it had in years at the site of Prigozhin. Before, he was just one of Putin's rich contractor buddies. Now, he was arguably Russia's most powerful individual besides Putin himself, and maybe the head of the FSB. Though the old chief directorate ain't what it used to be. Ah, to go back to the good old days. However, even the richest of the oligarchs don't have their own army. But Shoigu had an advantage. Rising that fast overnight, hogging the limelight, and exerting influence through force instead of incentive, 
doesn't make you many friends among the elite. On the contrary, Prigozhin was an existential threat to the established order. So, if Pierogi the Bald wanted to play politics, Shoigu was more than happy to oblige. When Putin ordered partial mobilization, Shoigu immediately lobbied the Kremlin to ban Wagner's ability to recruit from Russia's prisons. After all, we have enough manpower now. Shouldn't we leave the majority of the front to the army? Even though the army themselves are recruiting prisoners, but we don't talk about it. After all, it's our operation and our responsibility. Wagner was just a stopgap measure. This cut off Wagner's primary manpower supply. But Shoigu wasn't done, or no. Because of mobilization, this also meant the Russian government could order what our militaries call stop loss, meaning their elite formations, Spetsnaz, VDV, naval infantry, etc., could be forced to stay in beyond their contracts, as while it wasn't a war technically, they were now on an emergency footing. Basically, the only way Wagner was going to get new soldiers was by getting volunteers, hence all the billboards. Naturally, Prigozhin didn't take this lying down. He immediately declared a public relations flame war against the MOD and the general staff. He blasted Shoigu and Grasimov publicly and plainly over the Kharkiv counteroffensive, accusing them of incompetence while wasting the lives of Russian soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice to gain the territory just lost. He railed against their lies about the situation at the front, which made him very popular among the troops as well as the public. This was naturally very embarrassing for Russia's senior military leaders. The issue with that is, of course, that Wagner was completely underwritten by the MOD with all of their equipment, their tanks, artillery, helicopters and fighter jets, as well as literally all their supplies for their sustainment in the field, including ammunition and food. So, if Prigozhin wants to bite the hand that feeds him, they just won't feed him. He may be a caterer, but he can't feed his guns. Shoigu began cutting the allocations for supplies, ammunition and equipment to Wagner Group, as well as aligning the local commanders in the Bakhmut region against them. This is what led to the flurry of now infamous and highly memed videos of Prigozhin screaming at Shoigu about ammunition, while calling out not just the senior military officials for corruption and cowardice, but the other oligarchs affiliated with them. Essentially, he called out the entire Russian elite class, going so far as to say that the conditions on the front have led to a division in society similar to 1917, and that a, quote, soldiers uprising against this injustice, end quote, would happen unless changes were made. He even threatened to withdraw Wagner from Bakhmut entirely to save his men from dying, for Shoigu and Gerasimov's incompetence. Now, if that isn't a red flag, I don't know what is. Fermenting rebellion and insubordination aren't exactly small offences, but Prigozhin got a lot of political capital from this, especially among the enlisted ranks of the army and general public, though he got it by humiliating the entire Russian oligarchy. I am sure this won't have consequences later. The worst part about this whole situation, though, was that Shoigu had to back down. They needed Wagner to take Bakhmut. The Mobix hadn't arrived yet, and they were still reconstituting their Class A brigades, and so Prigozhin got his ammo. But it was clear to everyone, there would be a showdown eventually. And with the exception of a few insiders, no one knew just how soon that showdown was to come. Despite resolving the crisis in the short term, conflicts between Wagner and the MOD still occurred. Friendly fire incidents were common enough to make one think it was intentional, and it probably was. High casualties came with accusations of withheld support. Estimates from both Russian and Western sources claimed that half of all casualties suffered in Bakhmut were from Wagner. Eventually, though, with the weight of numbers and brute force, Russian troops managed to take the last few buildings remaining in the western half of the town. On May 20th, 2023, Prigozhin, in a joint statement with the MOD, declared victory in the city of Bakhmut, with garrison duty to be taken over by regular troops by June 5th. Russian forces conducted a relief in place as the 132nd Motor Rifle Brigade of the DNR and the 31st Air Assault Brigade took the place on the line left by Wagner. And it was here, I think, they set the fuse. As Wagner troops withdrew from the city in the first week of June, they were fired on by Russian troops. Worse still, they were fired on intentionally under the orders of the commander of the 72nd Motor Rifle Brigade, Roman Venevintin. Prigozhin responded immediately by launching a mutiny against Lieutenant Colonel Venevitin and taking him prisoner, and posting that video online to be viewed by millions. A flagrant breach of discipline and a direct armed challenge to the MOD. 
But once again, quick interventions from Southern Military District and General Sorovkin averted disaster and de-escalated the situation. Wagner withdrew to their bases on the Russian border for refit and reorganization, giving them time to replenish their losses, repair their gear, and restock their ammo, assumedly for the purpose of throwing back the imminent Ukrainian counteroffensive. Or so everyone thought. Well, everyone except the CIA. American intelligence agencies were, naturally, watching the war in Ukraine very closely, specifically the internal machinations of the Russian hierarchy, in order to gauge Russia's military and diplomatic intentions regarding American interests. And they had been seeing some very disconcerting warning signs. Warning signs bad enough that they predicted Wagner would make a move and briefed senior US officials up to two weeks before it happened. The Russian MOD as well as the oligarchs had been making various manoeuvres to curb Wagner's influence, and there were rumblings that the FSB were planning on opening a criminal case against Prigozhin for illegal activity. It was a known fact that they were poking around more than they usually would, which is fairly often at the best of times. Meanwhile, Wagner Group had gotten their last major wave of recruits. They were refitting with new equipment and resting up. Practically the entire PMC with its most combat experienced soldiers were all in one place with their best toys. The thing was, they weren't fighting, and it was now that Shoigu finally lit the fuse. On June 10th, the Russian MOD released a decree requiring all Wagner personnel to officially sign contracts with the professional military, effectively integrating Wagner into the chain of command. Wagner were no longer to operate on their own, they would be forced to dance to Shoigu's tune. The musicians would become the audience, and they were to do it by July 1st. Prigozhin categorically rejected this demand, citing incompetence from the Russian MOD as his primary reason, accusing them of corruption, poor leadership, and crucially, deceiving both the people and their commander-in-chief. Prigozhin's anger was pretty obvious. He wasn't a traitor. He was telling truth to power. He was the hero who took Bakhmut. He was looking out for the boys, and most of all, he was looking out for Putin. Negotiations began on the contracts, but the MOD didn't budge. Wagner was going to fall in line or face the consequences. The countdown had started, and on June 23rd, 2023, the timer reached zero. On June 23rd, Prigozhin released a video containing a declaration of war on the Ministry of Defense. He accused the oligarchs of leading the Russian people into a war in Ukraine on false pretenses, that the entire establishment had lied to both the president and the people about NATO operations in Ukraine, and that the oligarchic clan, as he put it, had their own nefarious reasons for invading, mostly to line their own pockets. And then he crossed the line. He revealed the true casualty numbers of the Russian forces in Ukraine, directly contradicting Putin's own statements. Telegram, Twitter, VK, just about every single social media platform exploded with the developments and word spread fast throughout the organs of the Russian state. As the saying goes, defecation collided with oscillation. Emergency meetings were called. Shoigu left his headquarters and ran straight to Moscow. The FSB damn near had a stroke and the security forces were put on alert. Then, Prigozhin dropped a second video, claiming that the Russian military had fired on Wagner's camps in the Donbass with a missile strike, killing or wounding at least 2,000 of his men. Independent sources can't verify whether or not this strike took place, and of course, the MOD fervently denied it. Whether it happened or not doesn't really matter, though. Its intended effect was to rally as much support for his next move, a declaration of war on the Ministry of Defense for real, titled The March for Justice, at least that's what he called it. He called for a mass uprising against the Ministry of Defense and mobilized his troops for battle. The FSB immediately opened their case file, charging Prigozhin with armed insurrection and labeled him an enemy of the state. High treason, as it were. Wagner troops began a rapid deployment across the Russian border, heading towards Rostov-on-Don. At this point, one has to ask what the plan was. And honestly, I don't think Prigozhin had even gotten this far in his dreams, let alone in his planning. Neither did the MOD, for that matter, as they didn't even raise their alert status. They made some frantic calls, but most outside observers put down their slow response to the same reaction we had. And I do mean we. As at this point, your favourite NAFO talking heads, including myself, went live to cover events, the VOD of which you'll find here on this channel or on D Dylan Burns' channel. The general consensus amongst everyone watching was, He's bluffing, there's no way. 
But as the sun rose in Russia, General Sorovkin made a statement calling on Wagner troops to stand down, his personal defence weapon clearly on display as a sign of intent. Back down or there will be violence. This was further confirmed by Lieutenant General Alexeyev, which is really ironic. You Tom Clancy fans out there will know exactly why. He ordered the mercenaries to return to barracks and abandon their commander. At this point, the Roskvardia, FSB internal troops, and the GIU Spetsnaz were ordered to full alert and to man their posts at critical locations across the regions in Wagner's path. It was about to go down. Only it didn't. Wagner troops entered Rostov-on-Don early in the morning in force. They were fully armed with tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, artillery. They even had Panzer anti-aircraft systems. And then Putin's worst nightmare happened. The security forces, Southern Military District, the Roskvardia, everybody, put their weapons on safe and waved Wagner through their checkpoints. Oh no. In the early morning of June 24th, Wagner Group occupied the city of Rostov-on-Don with no resistance. Worse still, the civilian populace welcomed them. While the officers negotiated with the senior leadership of the Russian army in the area, the NCOs parked their tanks out the front of Russia's nationalized McDonald's and grabbed a bacon and egg McMuffin meal with a coffee, while the privates pulled security, taking selfies with the civilians. Prigozhin, meanwhile, went to meet the Deputy Defense Minister Yevkurov. Yevkarov, Yevkarov, and Lieutenant General Alexeyev, both of whom Wagner had taken into custody. They both tried to convince Prigozhin to stand down, which of course was completely rejected. And so Wagner started on their merry jaunt to Moscow, with a column of around 5,000 fighters led by our favourite neo-Nazi Dmitry Utkin. The speed of their advance was absolutely terrifying, and it caught literally everyone by surprise. Their armoured fighting vehicles had been mounted on flatbeds at full combat readiness, with their crews riding in them as their wheeled vehicles rolled at full speed down the highway, which is actually kind of genius, not gonna lie. They covered the distance to Voronezh in less than half a day when they hit their first line of determined resistance. Russian air assets, both fixed-wing and rotary, were monitoring Wagner's advance and relaying the information back to Moscow. They were also acting as electronic warfare aircraft to restrict their communications and try to quarantine them. However, they weren't aware that Wagner were armed with advanced anti-air systems, so they ordered frontal aviation assets to close and engage. This would end up costing Russian frontal aviation dearly. Three MI-8 electronic warfare helicopters, one MI-8 transport helicopter, one KA-52 alligator attack helicopter, one MI-35 attack helicopter, and an IL-22M airborne command post. That's a lot of losses. Wagner troops engaged in limited skirmishes with the army garrison in Voronezh, securing their bases and reportedly acquiring some of the heavy equipment stored there. With this done, the column advanced on their primary target, Moscow. At this point, concern had become rampant panic. Flights and bus tickets out of the city were sold out within hours, despite calls from the Kremlin for a curfew. The Moscow Fortress Plan was initiated along with a counter-terrorist regime as GRU security troops manned the barricades and mounted their combat vehicles. Putin and his cabinet began evacuating the capital, with flight radar tracking multiple Russian VIP aircraft leaving Moscow for St. Petersburg, including Putin's personal aircraft, though official reports from Russian media are that Putin remained in the Kremlin. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I don't believe that, but hey... Well, if they say, right guys? We can always trust the Russian government, they wouldn't lie to us. Construction crews started digging up the M4 highway to slow the advance, only for Wagner to just bust through the obstacles and the roadblocks and continue anyway. At this point, they were approaching the Rubicon, or in this case, the Oka River. The Jajinsky Division began garrisoning the river crossings with preparations to blow the bridges. They were supplemented by FSB security forces and Alpha Group Spetsnaz, who were defending key objectives in the city of Moscow itself. Battle seemed inevitable as Russian Air Force fast movers hit the column as it approached. It was then that Putin made this speech. We don't want to repeat this. We protect our nation and our nation from any в том числе от внутреннего предательства. А то, с чем мы столкнулись, это именно предательство. Непомерные амбиции и личные интересы привели к измене. К измене и своей стране. 
и своему народу, и тому делу, за которое бок о бок с другими нашими частями и подразделениями сражались и погибали бойцы и командиры группы «Вагнер». Эта битва, когда решается судьба нашего народа, требует единения всех сил, единства, консолидации и ответственности, когда в сторону должно быть отброшено все, что ослабляет нас. Любые распри, которыми могут воспользоваться и пользуются наши внешние враги, чтобы подорвать нас изнутри. И потому действия, которые раскалывают наше единство, это, по сути, отступничество от своего народа. От боевых товарищей, которые сражаются сейчас на фронте. Это удар в спину нашей стране и нашему народу. Повторю, любая внутренняя смута – смертельная угроза для нашей государственности, для нас, как нации. Это удар по России, по нашему народу. И наши действия по защите Отечества от такой угрозы будут жесткие. Все, кто сознательно встал на путь предательства, кто готовил вооруженный мятеж, встал на путь шантажа и террористических методов, понесут неименуемое наказание. Prigozhin's master had picked a side. The FSB raided Wagner's headquarters in St. Petersburg and reportedly began kidnapping Wagner's members' families. Meanwhile, in Rostov, Kadyrov's Chechens were marching against his defense perimeter as Utkin was reporting the Moscow garrison was readying for a fight. It was at this moment, this very singular moment, that Pierogi the Bold realized that he may have miscalculated. We don't know for certain, but we are pretty sure he had planned on having the army defect, gaining the support of several senior commanders in the process, while keeping Putin neutral, hoping that he would maybe switch sides and support him if it looked like he was going to come out on top. Instead, all his allies had turned on him, and the commander-in-chief has now labelled him public enemy number one to the entire population. His gambit had failed. He was now faced with a choice. Negotiate his way out while he still held some bargaining power, or go down fighting. And given that this is an oligarch we're talking about, self-serving cowardice will always win in that dilemma. And so he made overtures to the Kremlin, who immediately told him to go fornicate himself. However, eventually the cabinet decided that preventing a battle in Russia's capital that could possibly last a week and cause irreparable damage was the best option. So they called a virtual meeting with Prigozhin to negotiate, which, according to official sources, was led by none other than Potato Man himself, President Lukashenko of Belarus. However, it was most likely Belarus's ambassador to Russia, Boris Grizlov, who handled the negotiation. Nevertheless, the terms were simple. Wagner and Prigozhin would receive legal immunity for their rebellion and guarantees on their future security. In exchange, Wagner soldiers who remain in Russia can either join the Russian military or resign and go home. As to Prigozhin and his acolytes who wanted to remain as mercenaries, they would be exiled to Belarus and start serving Lukashenko instead. Given the current situation, it was a pretty sweet deal. Even if he took Moscow, he wouldn't be able to hold it. And by now, it was clear the mass defection and changing of allegiances from Shoigu's camp wasn't happening. So he took the deal, releasing this public statement. They wanted to disband the Wagner military company. We embarked on a march of justice on June 23. In 24 hours we got to within 200 kilometers of Moscow. In this time we did not spill a single drop of our fighters' blood. Now the moment has come when blood would be spilled. Understanding responsibility for the chance that Russian blood will be spilled on one side, we are turning our columns around and heading back to field camps as planned. <laughs> Sorry for that accent, but uh, they didn't have a recording of that with a translation in English, so uh, you know how it goes. That night, Wagner troops began withdrawing to their encampments in the Donbass and standing down. The Russian Civil War had lasted for all of a day, which is a shame, but hey, here's how it goes. But while the physical damage was limited, the structural and psychological damage done was catastrophic. Yes, the coup was over, but the fallout... <laughs> oh, that's, that's just getting started. And at time of writing, it is still very much ongoing, even almost a month later, and most likely will be for the remainder of Putin's presidency, however long that will be. Which is yet another factor we need to discuss. In any case, let's analyze this mess.
So let's start with Wagner. What the hell were they thinking? And as I said at the time, evidence suggests they weren't, or at least it was a plan that went outrageously out of control. Wagner was larger and more heavily armed than one could reasonably expect a PMC to be, but even with their expansion they only numbered perhaps 20,000 men in total, with as few as half that in country ready for combat. No matter how you cut it, they weren't going to win a stand-up fight against the Russian military, even with a majority of their forces pinned down in Ukraine. Their objective, according to Prigozhin, was not regime change, rather it was to fight against corruption and enact changes inside the MOD while ensuring Wagner's autonomy. And given the relative balance of forces, I actually believe his intention wasn't regime change or to topple the government, rather a show of force to attain a better bargaining position to secure the independence of Wagner PMC like he claims. He had to know an actual coup was practically impossible, and even if it wasn't, what kind of government could Wagner even form? Like a disparate partisan group, once they'd actually gotten power, you know, once it actually got them power, I wouldn't know what to do with it. I mean, they, they wouldn't have any idea what to do with it. They're just a PMC. He's an oligarch with like 20,000 guys. He has no idea what to do with that much power, nor would they be able to keep the various tendrils of the Russian oligarchy in line once they had it. Putin's rhetoric is usually garbage, but in this, his comparison to 1917 is spot on. This would have been civil war had it gone to its furthest extent, as the oligarchs in the various military districts ate each other for control. If you've ever seen a gang fall apart or a particularly vicious breakup involving several friend groups, all you need to do is scale up. As Russia isn't really a nation state, rather it's one giant organized crime syndicate. And Wagner wouldn't be able to form an authority or run a government with the men they had, nor does their leader really have the popularity or political capital with the elite to get any allies to do it. On the contrary, the reason why he was attempting to stage a coup in the first place is because the MOD forcibly integrating his company into the military against his will, while confiscating all his assets, puts him in an impossible position. An effort they are only undertaking because he is threatening the status quo and everyone in it in the first place. Not to mention, when he began this farce, he essentially called all the most powerful men in Russia hideously corrupt, while accusing them of manufacturing a war for their own game. Both of which being absolutely true. However, if the key to launching a coup is turning the power structure on itself, insulting all the people you desperately need as allies to win is not the brightest move. The only logical conclusion one can draw is that Prigozhin was betting on mass support from the rank and file. His choice of dialogue reflects it. March for justice, stop lying to the people, gamers rise up, etc. He is a populist figure on Russian Telegram and has a war hero brand recognition from taking Bakhmut. He was gambling on mass defection from the frontline troops and security forces as he marched through the country like some 21st century Napoleon. If only he'd actually managed to burn Moscow like he did. Yeah. What a sight that would be. But yeah, nah. If he'd seen this through and fought it out, he would have been, as the youth say, absolutely clapped, smoked, styled on, obliterated, or any other number of super Ks for an utter defeat. So if overthrowing Putin, proclaiming new Muscovy, and waging a Renaissance Italy Merck's paradise campaign across all of Eastern Europe while starting Russian Civil War III Kremlin catastrophe wasn't their plan, and driving to Moscow obviously wasn't the original plan because let's face it, that whole thing was stupid given how small their force was, what actually was their plan? Well, this is where we start speculating, but the rumours we've been hearing tied into the facts we know paints an interesting picture. So you remember earlier when I mentioned that the CIA knew the coup was in the works, perhaps up to two weeks in advance? Well, it's time to give the FSB some credit. Despite the fact that they sure as hell aren't the KGB anymore, they are still one of the most effective intelligence agencies in the world. In fact, given the Russian national character, military deception and espionage, or duplicitous dishonesty, is one thing they are very, very good at. So despite the turf wars, bureaucracy and incompetence of their various support organs, if the CIA could see this coup coming from outside, the FSB could definitely see it as well, and NATO intelligence is 99% sure they did. Prior to the Moscow Mania Thunder Run, which, God willing, is going to be the name of my monster truck show I run in the Free People's Republic of Russia a decade from now, but yes, prior to the coup de bliette, the FSB were looking into Prigozhin at the behest of the elites in preparation for the dissolution of Wagner PMC. They had to know that he wasn't going to lie down and you know, just quietly take that, and his public profile wasn't exactly low-key. To use a historical metaphor, you had Caesar in Transalpine Gaul with the 13th Legion. If he quietly submits, he's going down and he knows it, 
so it's pretty obvious he won't, so he's going to try and negotiate. Now as we know, neither he nor Caesar had any real chance, but there was always the wild card option that he could pull off a temporary victory to have something to trade for his security. Unlike Rome, however, Russia already had a dictator, and if Caesar had tried this against Sulla, he would have been stomped like a bug. So, with all the information available for us at time of recording, here's what happened. Rostov-on-Don is the primary logistics hub for the Donbass front in Ukraine. Everything has to run through there, from fuel to reinforcements to rations to toilet paper. It's also the site of Russia's army group headquarters for the Donbass and Southern Military District, a command post that Shoigu and Gerasimov frequently visit for updates on the war or for public relations purposes, to show strong commanders leading at the front. Julius Caesar's plan, after crossing the Rubicon, was to use his small but elite force to rush to Rome and seize the Senate in order to coerce them into legitimizing his claim on leadership before Pompey could raise enough legions to stop him. Prigozhin had the same idea. Wait for Shoigu or Gerasimov, ideally both, to visit Southern Military District, which they were scheduled to do in the last week of June, and then launch a lightning strike on Rostov, capturing them both while seizing the most crucial supply hub of the whole war, with high-ranking hostages, a defensible position, and his entire force concentrated in one place, ideally with lots of support from local army commanders as well as frontline units. With all of this in place, he could negotiate from a position of strength while forcing out his rivals. It's a bold move, which has issues in long-term viability. But for a last-ditch gamble, it's actually got relatively good odds. As we've seen, he did take Rostov and locked it down. The Roskvardia and the local army units didn't resist while he grabbed all the depots and secured the primary government buildings. Had he managed to capture Shoigu, decapitating the chain of command while getting a valuable hostage, he would have enough troops and supplies to make a fight of it while compromising the Donbass front in Ukraine. This gives him leverage. The only issue, of course, is to make this move, to carry out this dastardly plan, he would need sympathizers inside the Russian army. The redeployment, equipment, resupply, ammo, manpower, movement orders, rolling stock, trucks, fuel, food, and passage into Russia. They need support from local commanders and a good chunk of Southern Military District to do it. Which means relaying their plan and the requirements to various commanders and officers they trusted to join them. But of course, the more people involved in a conspiracy, the harder it is to keep it covert. Which, given that Russia is an organized crime syndicate, as we said, with a dictator at its head, it would be almost impossible for them to maintain operational security. Even in this modern day, Russian intelligence thrives on inside informants practically everywhere throughout their country. It's just how Russia works. And it's evident, despite their inaction during the actual events, the readiness in which the Roskvardia and FSB troops mustered, geared up and deployed, was a lot faster than one would expect, even for a country at war, leading analysts to believe they were on a higher alert status prior to the coup's start. Indeed, Shoigu cancelled his visit two days prior, while Gerasimov was nowhere to be found. It's highly likely that someone squealed, and the only reason Wagner got as far as they did is because no one thought they would actually be dumb enough to try once their plan was discovered. The running theory is that Prigozhin discovered he'd been ratted out and made a last-ditch play out of desperation, thunder running to Moscow to seize what advantage he could before being forced to cave, which amazingly seems to have worked out. For now. We know old Vlad doesn't like to forget a grudge, which leads us to the most important discussion, Vladimir Putin's position. When Wagner launched their coup, they were immediately branded traitors. Furthermore, the support required from the military was not forthcoming as it was expected, most likely because the plan had been leaked and those hedging their bets quickly backed the regime for their own survival. But Putin has a huge problem. When Wagner rolled in, the security forces were on alert waiting for them. As stated before, the coup attempt had been rumbled, yet when Roskvardia and the FSB security forces came face to face with the vanguard, they backed down and let Wagner pass. Aside from the odd skirmish and aerial attack, Wagner pretty much made their way all the way to Moscow entirely unmolested during the entire duration of the crisis. And it was this, I think, that forced Putin to negotiate. When the security forces didn't fight against the rebels, almost every elite in Moscow packed their bags and ran for St. Petersburg as fast as their little rat legs could carry them. The thing is, Russian media and Vatniks in the post-coup aftermath are claiming that Putin achieved a diplomatic masterstroke. He got rid of Prigozhin and integrated Wagner with only minimal loss of life, all while maintaining his current hierarchy of cronies. 
In fact, he's been going on very public tours with Shoigu around Russia to assure the people that everything is under control, leading to some very hilarious appearances of his uh, body doubles. However, the reality is, as most of you know, the fact that he negotiated at all is a portent of certain doom. Dictators like Putin don't negotiate or placate rivals to their power. They crush them, mercilessly, which is what Putin ordered his military to do. Furthermore, even after agreeing to Prigozhin's terms, he immediately released a second statement where he upheld the MOD's forced integration of Wagner Group, condemned unnamed conspirators as traitors, and has since entered the beginning phases of a purge in the Russian military. So not only did he negotiate with insurrectionist terrorists, he then reneged on the deal the moment it became convenient, simultaneously destroying his facade of power, along with what remains of his credibility. But this in my view, and it's a view I've seen more and more people share, is not what's really dangerous for Putin's regime. The true danger is in Putin's actions, and his appearances. As we've noticed, we've all seen it, he is wearing body armour 90% of the time in his public appearances. His readiness to negotiate, his PR campaign with Shoigu, the mass arrests of suspected conspirators. What we are seeing from Putin is the one thing a dictator shouldn't be showing. And that's fear. His security services had been on standby. Indicators are that he had prior warning. He had shored up his oligarch support and had all the cronies under his thumb. Yet when it came time for the showdown, when it came time to crush the rebels and assert his dominance, his armed forces, half the oligarchs, and most terrifying of all, the Russian people, simply waved at Wagner as they drove towards Moscow. We have historical precedent for this. During Operation Valkyrie, the attempted coup against Adolf Hitler by the Wehrmacht's conservative faction, German troops across the Reich followed orders and arrested the SS without question. Yet at the same time, other army units, police garrisons and communication centres, followed orders from both the plotters and the OKW headquarters in East Prussia, the Wolf's Lair. Halfway through the operation, everyone, literally everyone knew it was a coup. No one was under any illusions as to what was going on, and yet half the people involved sat on the fence. Which makes complete sense. If you side with the losing team, you get killed as traitors. Yet very often, the other team will only succeed based on your support, meaning your decision could be the one that tips the balance. The problem is, you don't know that for a fact. You can't exactly call the unit in the next town and go, Hey guys, uh, uh, you want to commit treason to, you know, save our necks? And so that's what happened here. Most of the Russian armed forces facing down Wagner either joined them or simply said, there's no way I'm going anywhere near this. Uh, you guys have fun. I'm going to keep fighting in Ukraine. Uh, when you sort it out amongst yourselves, uh, let me know. Why take the risk when you don't have to? And as for the Russian people, the problem is one of Putin's own making, though it's one that has its roots buried deep in the Russian national character. With the exception of early 1900s and uh, 1991, the Russian people have had precisely zero political agency throughout their history. Under Putin's regime, the majority of people are apolitical, or rather politically disengaged because it's either useless to try and change things, or it's simply too dangerous to publicly voice an opinion. Under the Soviet Union, the party had complete control, and while you could participate in the party and effect change slowly, ultimately the workers themselves, inside the so-called workers' state, had very little overall power to push reforms or change, and if you tried it in the early days, you were gulagged or executed as a counter-revolutionary. It wasn't until Gorbachev that they had the ability to make changes, and when they did, the Soviet Union imploded. Which tells you just how they felt about the party. Other than that, Russians have had really no say in their government, nor do they have a culture of liberty or democracy. For them, as it was under the Tsar, so it is now. Doesn't matter which corrupt oligarchic warlord or monarch is in charge, what matters is how much tax did he want from me, and can I get what I need at a decent price in the shops. We've had scenes of teenagers going to school, street sweepers cleaning the footpaths and sidewalks, the Wagner forces got breakfast at McDonald's for fuck's sake. Nothing changed at all. And that to Putin was absolutely terrifying. His complete and utter irrelevance. The Russian people don't care. He had a lot of domestic support, sure, mainly because, like Stalin or Brezhnev, he is a big strong figure who has been in power for so long, no one has really any idea what it would be like without him around. Hell, he's been Russia's de facto leader since 1997. But now the idea has started to enter the heads of both the Russian people 
and the oligarchs that Putin is no longer the only option. If someone got enough support, someone smarter and more organized than Pierogi the Bold, a different leader in Russia would be possible, and the people would be perfectly happy to go along with it. In fact, since the special military operation has gone so badly, the option of an alternative may give the Russian people the single most dangerous thing to a dictator of all. Hope. And if that happened, all of his security forces, even the FSB internal troops, may just sit there and watch him fall rather than risk their necks. And so he's lashing out. At the time of writing, General Sorovkin has been put under house arrest, though he remains in his post and has held a uh, press conference thing with the MOD, so, you know, he might still be alive. His deputy, meanwhile, though, has been dismissed from the army in disgrace, and uh, I have a feeling he might be falling out of a window sometime soon. There are rumours that other purges at the lower levels in Southern Military District are currently underway. A lot of officers and generals have gone missing. It's also no secret that even before the coup attempt, some of the more popular and powerful oligarchs in Russia have accidentally fallen out of windows or met tragic accidents, and we expect more of them to come. Putin has to clamp down. If he doesn't, he's inviting further rebellion. But in doing so, he's also going to be sowing discontent. If he takes it too far, once again, he's going to find himself in just as much trouble. But the problems aren't just with Putin. This whole escapade points to something even more dangerous. A complete breakdown in cohesion among the different factions of the Russian armed forces. Wagner Group telegram channels, after Prigozhin ordered his men to withdraw, were in pure uproar. They had been prepared to fight, and now their leader is just backed down. Likewise, Putin loyalists and hardcore nationalists were furious that Putin had allowed treasonous mercenary scum to live. They should all be put up against a wall and shot. And you're going to ask these two sides to make up and hug it out and then go and fight the real enemy to the west? I don't think that's going to go well. Especially when everyone saw just how easy it was to march through the Russian interior unhindered. Imagine what a full division could do. And I'm sure some military leaders are thinking just that. Meanwhile, Prigozhin and Wagner are still very much alive and reportedly setting up in Belarus, although reports differ on that. Some reports say he's still in Russia, Wagner is still in Russia, there's no evidence of bases being set up in Belarus. It's all up in the air, air right now, but um, basically, whatever's happening, Wagner has been broken off from the Russian military table of organization, robbing them of a valuable, well-trained, and battle-hardened formation of troops, while simultaneously pissing off NATO's eastern flank. So much so, in fact, the Baltics have announced they are practically doubling their military budget, while closely cooperating with both Poland and Germany. Some Vatniks are still calling this whole coup C8-dimensional tic-tac-toe in order to redeploy Wagner and pin down NATO while threatening Kyiv. These people are morons, and you should ignore them. So to sum up, Putin has lost his credibility as well as his facade of invincibility. He was forced to negotiate with traitors who almost captured his capital within 24 hours after advancing from the Black Sea. He's carrying out purges, flapping around on the PR circuit to prevent panic, while desperately trying to restore control. He looks weak and afraid. The Russian military and Wagner, while not impacted severely on the front lines, will have institutional issues going forward. You can't just merge two organizational structures which were at each other's throats and not expect a turf war. And the longer this goes on, the worse it will get. The chances of further internal conflict are not just high, they are likely. In short, this wasn't a failed coup attempt at all. This is what we call Round 1. And even though Round 1 went to Putin, it is most definitely a Pyrrhic victory. The Russian people and the majority of Russia's institutional personnel have made it clear they are completely disinterested regarding who's in charge, as long as that person does a reasonable job and they get to keep their job. While popular uprising is still very unlikely, a considerable number of soldiers defected to Wagner or stood aside, showing the discontent in the forces. If and when another challenge to Putin happens, and my guess it will happen sooner rather than later, things could get very precarious for old Vladdy. He's a survivor and has built an institution around himself, Getting rid of him won't be easy, but recent events show it's not impossible. And finally, that leads on to the last question. How has this affected the war? Well, aside from Russia losing what's arguably its most effective force, 
Prigozhin's empire was also responsible for most of the Russian MOD's food supply, which is going to raise a lot of problems in their supply chain. Which, uh, given the problems they've been having, is not exactly ideal. I mean, I guess they could always resort to the meat cube, but uh, I don't think they're that desperate yet. Although, maybe soon. In any case, that just about covers everything, except its effect on Ukraine's counteroffensive, which I'll cover when we see more developments. Though, in terms of how it's going right now, well, all I can say is, have you had a look at Bakhmut lately? Slava Ukraini.